Україна здивувала світ. Україна надихнула світ. Україна об'єднала світ. На доказ можна сказати тисячі слів, але достатньо кількох. Хаймарс, Петріол, Абрамс, Айрісті, Челенджер, Насамс, Леопард. Владимир Путін thought it would be a matter of a few hours. That in just a few days Ukraine would be fully under his control. According to his plans, the Russian army would advance at full speed and would occupy Kyiv within a few days. Zelensky and his government would abandon the capital. The Ukrainian army would surrender and everything would be ready for the victory parade. Putin would have his great military feat and Ukraine would be back under the thumb of the Russian motherland. We also found some parade uniforms there. So they expected to get to Kyiv in two days and then have a parade here. So we can say now that we have completely destroyed their plans. Alexander Fruzevich, the deputy chief of staff of the command of the ground forces of Ukraine. However, the course of events could not have been more different. The Ukrainians held out against all odds. International aid arrived on an unimaginable scale, and the Russian army turned out to have more holes than a Swiss cheese. The result, not only was there no victory parade, but one year later, the war rages on, and Russia has suffered an enormous number of casualties, both in terms of equipment and as well as men. According to existing estimates, more than 180,000 Russian soldiers were killed or wounded during the first year of the invasion alone. We're talking about an average of almost 500 casualties every day. What's more, in just 12 months of war, the Russian army has lost more generals and high-ranking officers than in seven years in Syria, or than the Soviets did during their 10-year war in Afghanistan. And to make matters worse, the casualties have hit many of Russia's best-trained units, such as the airborne troops and naval infantry. But that is not even the end of it. Check out this news item. Russia likely lost more than half its tanks in Ukraine, estimates show. We're talking about more than 2,300 tanks. In total, according to the count carried out by British intelligence, Russia could also have lost more than 4,500 armored vehicles of all types, 63 aircraft, 70 helicopters, 12 naval vessels, and hundreds of artillery systems. And this is only taking into account the losses that are relatively well documented. In other words, a real disaster. To give you an idea, despite all of its attempts and to the astonishment of all NATO armies, Russia was not even able to take Kharkiv, a city located only 50 kilometers, that's around 30 miles from its border, and one of its main targets during the invasion. Yes, so let's make no mistake. It is true that with his missiles and artillery, Putin is destroying Ukraine. Cities like Mariupol, Severodonetsk, Irpin, Popasna and Bakhmut prove it. But do you know what? Despite all the losses suffered by the Russian army, Putin has not achieved a single one of his main objectives. Zelensky's government seems stronger than ever. The supposed unification of the Slavic nation has been a resounding failure. Ukraine has not fallen, and to top it off, its ties with the West are much stronger and its army is much better armed. Наша віра зміцнила, зміцнив наш дух. Ми вистояли перший день повномасштабної війни. Ми не знали, що буде завтра, але точно зрозуміли, за кожне завтра треба битись. Now, does this all mean that Russian dictator Vladimir Putin might be willing to give in? Well, it certainly doesn't look like it. One year after the invasion, according to British Defense Secretary Ben Wallace, Russia currently has 97% of its combat forces deployed in the Ukrainian war. Despite this, neither side seems to have victory in its grasp. Neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians. So the question is, how on earth is this hell going to end? How can the war in Ukraine be brought to a close? What scenarios are on the table for the major international organizations? Well, let's take a look. Looking for the exit door. In early October 2021, a very important meeting was held in the most important office on the planet, the Oval Office. Among others, the meeting was attended by US President Joe Biden, CIA Director William Burns, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Forces, General Mark Milley. What was the reason for the meeting? Well, basically, to analyze the latest intelligence information indicating that Vladimir Putin might be about to invade Ukraine. We're not talking about conjecture, but about information. The risk was absolutely absolutely real. We're talking about the beginning of October 2021, almost five months before the Kremlin's troops finally launched themselves on Ukraine. At that meeting, as confirmed by Milley himself, four lines of action were agreed upon. 
First, an armed conflict between Russia and NATO had to be avoided at all costs. Second, in the event of war, everything possible should be done to contain it within the geographical boundaries of Ukraine. Third, the strengthening and cohesion of NATO was key. The phone had to be picked up as soon as possible. And fourth, and possibly the key point, not only of the meeting, but of everything we have experienced since, Ukraine had to be empowered and given the means to fight. Yes, visual politic community. That was none other than a meeting in which the United States decided that this time it would not stand in the shadows. If Russia infringed on Ukraine's sovereignty and freedom, Ukrainians would not be left to their own devices. That was the meeting at which the strategy was set, which then gradually evolved and which, along with the solidarity of many European allies and above all, the tenacity, endurance and courage of the Ukrainians have caused Vladimir Putin to run into a huge wall. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. Kyiv stands proud. It stands tall. And most important, it stands free. Kyiv remains free. International allies have supported Ukraine. In total, they have committed more than $160 billion in military, humanitarian, and financial aid. A huge amount of resources that has to be able to cover the needs of this country until at least the end of 2023. Nobody thought the Russians would start a medieval war in the 21st century. This conflict is going to change the face of Europe as much as World War II did. James Rich, Republican senator from Idaho and a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But obviously, while the fact that Kyiv is still free is great news, the war War, destruction and annihilation of lives is still a terrible scenario. So the question is, what are the ways out of the war? Well, here are the four ways the war could be brought to an end. Of course, not all of them are equally desirable. Any one of them, starting with the first one, would be terrible for everyone. Listen up. One, let Ukraine go. Putin was counting on the rest of the world to do absolutely nothing, that the rest of the countries would stand idly by and watch him impose his will on a country that he himself does not consider as an independent nation. And you know what? In a way, this could still happen. Take, for example, the cases of Trump and his entourage in the United States, or Le Pen in France, who openly speak out against helping Ukraine. Of course, let's not fool ourselves. If Ukraine supply were to be cut off, sooner or later, Ukraine would most likely end up falling, or at best, negotiating a ceasefire, which would be a victory for Putin and a disaster for Ukraine. In fact, Western weariness remains one of Vladimir Putin's greatest assets and explains in large part why he is still sticking to his plan. And that is precisely why Biden's trip to Kyiv as a clear manifestation of commitment was so important. Abandoning Ukraine would mean leaving Ukrainians under the yoke of Moscow, or in other words, facing a lot of repression and purges of all kinds. The hundreds of bodies that were, in many cases, tortured from Bukha and Izium are a good example. But not only that, it would also be catastrophic for the rest of the world. Think about it. We would be telling all the tyrants on the planet that not only do they have a free pass to do as they please, when they please, but also that fate accompli and the politics of force are the best guarantee of success. Now apply that thinking to places like Taiwan, Korea and Moldova and you have a winning formula for the worst of all worlds. If Putin wins in Ukraine, the message to him and other authoritarian leaders will be that they can use force to get what they want. This will make the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. This is precisely why this option is completely ruled out. President Putin is confronted with something today that he didn't think was possible a year ago. The democracies of the world have grown stronger, not weaker. But the autocrats of the world have grown weaker, not stronger. This brings us directly to the second possible outcome. To freeze the war. First, the Russian offensive, and then the Ukrainian counter-offensives. On the first anniversary of the invasion, the war was already in a kind of lethargy, at least from a territorial point of view. The major clashes were limited to very specific points, such as Bakhmut. The Russians have sent many thousands of men to reinforce their defenses, entrench themselves, and thus try to defend the conquered territory. It is evident that the casualties suffered by Russia have been enormous, but Ukraine has also suffered a huge number of casualties, both military and civilian. And although it has received a lot of military 
military hardware, it still does not seem enough to clearly win the war. If the Allies maintain their support, but reduce deliveries, the conflict could drag on for years, and then even freeze completely. What's more, the passage of time itself could favour such an exit. Exhaustion, fatigue, loss of social and media attention, or the fear of another energy crisis could lead many countries to end up looking for a convenient way out. That is, to try to freeze the conflict and, in a sense, get back to normality. Even if Russia ends up launching an offensive, gains new territories, and then asks to reach a peace agreement, it is possible that many countries will put pressure on Kyiv to comply. And you know what? Ukraine itself may have no choice but to accept Russia's presence within its territory and the permanent sense of fear and frustration that goes with it. We keep repeating that Russia mustn't win, but what does that mean? If the war goes on for long enough with this intensity, Ukraine's losses will become unbearable, a senior French official told the Wall Street Journal. In addition, this would obviously mean much more pain and much more waiting for Ukrainians and it is certainly not clear what future this country would have. Could Ukraine really be rebuilt and attract foreign capital and business if the country technically remains at war, as part of its territory overrun, and the threat from Russia remains? It seems hard to imagine. And of course, we cannot overlook the fact that the Ukrainian economy is in tatters and its infrastructure is badly damaged. In other words, that could spell doom in the medium term, the inability for the country to ever be viable. Besides, couldn't Russia resume its offensive in a few years when Ukraine is weaker and they have managed to re-establish part of their military force, even if it is just by training recruits, this is a real risk. In any case, it would, in a way, be a victory for Russia. A less clear victory, but ultimately a victory. They would have annexed much of Ukraine, and in the end, the international community would not have done much beyond its initial flurry of action to prevent it. Beijing is watching closely to see the price Russia pays or the reward it receives for its aggression. What's happening in Europe today may happen in Asia tomorrow. Jens Stolenberg, NATO Secretary General. And take note, because if the arms supply to Ukraine is not increased, this scenario is quite likely. And perhaps the best way out for Russia and perhaps also for Vladimir Putin himself. That is why some allies, such as Germany or France, two countries that are not particularly comfortable with the war, I'll leave it to you to guess the reasons, have been convinced of another alternative, the third possibility to put an end to the fighting. Three, thinking 2024. In 2024, there are elections in Russia, and that is why Putin and his entourage could be the most interested in reaching a solution to the conflict before that date, lest a military and economic setback, therefore, call into question his continuity in the top job in the Kremlin. That is, if the war is not over, many Russian circles could push to get a failed president out of the way in order to place a new leader at the helm, taking advantage of what would technically be the end of the Russian president's term. Well, to avoid such a scenario, Putin might be willing to negotiate and make concessions. That, at least, is what both French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz seem to think. But for all of this to be possible, Ukraine must be in a position to harm Russia. This requires the rapid delivery of many more weapons. Leopards. Tanks? Well, that's the way it's going. What we need now is for Ukraine to launch a military offensive that pushes back the Russian front to open the way for a return to negotiations. Emmanuel Macron, President of France. And it might not even be necessary to wait until 2024. A Ukrainian offensive in the southeast capable of reaching the Sea of Azov, recapturing the entire Zaporizhia area and putting Crimea within artillery range could be enough to force a negotiation. This is what we would call the Big Bang action. Now, if a negotiated exit is reached, can we really trust Russia to keep its side of the bargain? Well, the truth is that history tells us that we can't. Ukraine, in fact, is a good example. Don't forget that Russia itself guaranteed in the Budapest Memorandum the security and complete sovereignty of Ukraine, including Crimea, in exchange for Ukraine's surrender of its nuclear weapons. Because remember that upon the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Ukraine became the third most heavily nuclear armed country in the world. Therefore, in exchange for these possible negotiations, Western countries would give Ukraine much more tangible security, enough military equipment to discourage any further Russian aggression in the future. We're talking about modern armored vehicles, missiles, an air force, and whatever else is necessary. An agreement with NATO could even be considered. And since we would be talking about an agreed exit, the country could try to get back on track. 
In this way, Ukraine could be shielded and have a future in exchange for certain concessions in an agreement that, although bad, would be much more acceptable than the previous scenario. This seems to be at least the perception of the Paris-Berlin tandem, which, according to what they say today, London does not see as a bad thing either. What's more, Ukraine would not run the risk of what could happen in 2025 if there were a change in the White House. And take note because, as of today, this may be by far the most likely end to the war. Of course, there is still another possible path, one with many supporters in Ukraine, Poland, the Baltic states, and also the United States of America. What am I talking about? Well, we're going to take a look right now. For victory at any price. 2023 started with very good news for Ukraine. We're talking about their commitment to deliver dozens and dozens, hundreds of armored vehicles, among other equipment, including modern tanks. We are talking Bradleys, Strikers, Marders, AMX-10, Challenger 2, Leopards, Patriot, Batteries, etc, etc, etc. If these deliveries are sustained and increased over time, the course of the war could change completely, especially if more HIMARS, more tanks, and long-range missiles are delivered, let alone if they were provided with more and better air aircraft and drones. And let's see, initially the delivery of weapons had been very restrained, in order, for example, not to have to accept a defeat against Russia if Ukraine finally did not withstand the challenge. And what can I say? It makes perfect sense. Otherwise, NATO would have been badly damaged, and the leadership of the United States would have been called into question. Of course, the implications for the rest of the world would have been enormous. Now, however, things are completely different. You see, according to many reports, the Russian army may be exhausted and under-equipped, which would explain why they are having such a hard time pulling off any offensive. It is true that Russia has sent many new men, thanks to conscription, but it is also true that the combat strength of these units does not seem particularly high. That is why a succession of strong counter-attacks by the Ukrainian army could blow up the Russian defense lines. In other words, there may be a chance to go all out, defeat Russia, and force its armies to retreat, and even leave Ukraine, perhaps with the sole exception of Crimea. In doing so, the damage to the Putin regime would be potentially irreparable. And the question is, but what would it take to achieve that? Much more extensive and more determined military support. Of course, on the one hand, this possibility would put the nuclear risk back on the table. But we already told you about that in a past video here on Visual Politic. We told you why Moscow was unlikely to resort to that possibility. Basically, because it would gain nothing. But naturally, the risk is still there. Particularly because this scenario would put the Russian leader in check. Obviously, losing a war against a much smaller country with far fewer resources is not a good thing, even more so when military modernization and making Russia a strong and great country again was the Putin regime number one priority for more than two decades. What's more, if history tells us anything, it is that it is very difficult for a regime to survive when it loses a war. Know what? Despite all the casualties and all the pain suffered, this is the option with the most supporters right now in Ukraine. Кожен українець когось втратив батька, сина, брата, маму, донечку, сестру, кохану людину, близького друга, колегу, сусіда, знайомого. So there you have it, Visual Politic viewers. These are the four possible scenarios for us to see the Ukrainian war end. You can see that in any case, the best ways out seems to call for a lot more weapons being delivered to the Ukrainian government. This is something that almost everyone seems to have understood, even Olaf Scholz himself. So now it's your turn. Which strategy do you think is the most important to follow? Which would you do if you were calling the shots? Leave us your answers in the comments and let's open up a debate. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic. All the best, see you next time. Next time.